and we produce the rock slate in which the platy minerals are arranged at right angles to the applied pressure. The kind of pressure under which the shale is suffering is about 2,000 kilograms per square centimeter, a good 20 people, 25 people on a sugar cube. The temperature, about oh, 300 degrees centigrade. So that's the first step in our transition from shale to granite. We produced slate. Now remember that the orientation of the platy minerals in the slate relates to the pressure that's being applied to the rock. So the bedding of the original shale is completely lost in the transition to slate. Slate break, breaks in flat plates like this so that you can use it for roofs, for example, because of the reorientation with regard to the pressure. In fact, the bedding of the slate might very well be like this, right across the, uh, the slatiness produced by the reorientation of the minerals. The next step is to the rock phyllite, the third rock in the series here. And the phyllite begins to show another change. It's a little bit sparkly. Perhaps you can see it as I move it in the light. What is happening is that crystals of muscovite are beginning to grow. They are the brown platy minerals on this diagram. These are new minerals, the first really new minerals that we've seen in the series. The temperature is now at about 400 degrees centigrade. The pressure has risen to that of maybe 40 people on a sugar cube at a depth of perhaps 9 or 10 kilometers, something of that kind. Now, the new minerals that have begun to grow in the phyllite are the micas. The micas, you'll remember, are related to the clay minerals. The transition is not a very great one. There's still some water, some structural water, we call it, in those micas. That water will later be lost in our transition. But first of all, the micas continue to grow. And the next rock in our series, in fact, is schist. This is the fourth rock in the series, the one that we commonly find down Highway 69, a rather attractive sparkling rock. And you can see that the dominant mineral in that schist is the very platy, very shiny mineral, muscovite, that you've already met in the unit on minerals. And this is the kind of structure that the schist has. The temperature now about 550 degrees centigrade, the pressure about 3,000 kilograms per square centimeter, and the rock schist. The pressure corresponds to a depth of about 12 kilometers, something of that order. Notice that the muscovite is still a mineral that has some water in its structure, some structural water. And the next change that occurs between the schist and the fifth rock in our series, the gneiss, which has got plagioclase eyes in it, these white uh, eyes that you can see here, and which has lost the foliation or the schistosity of the schist. The change there involves the mica, which becomes Con uh, converted into feldspar, the feldspars being the red blocky crystals in this diagram. Still some muscovite left, but not too much. The foliation being lost. There's much less of a platiness about this, uh, uh, this specimen, the gneiss. The pressure now at about 18 kilometers depth is about, oh, uh, four and a half thousand kilograms per square centimeter, the temperature about 625 degrees centigrade, thereabouts. It's difficult to be absolutely accurate, but that's approximately what it is. The water, the structural water in the micas has been driven out in order to produce the feldspars. You may remember 
from the uh, program that we did on igneous rocks, that the muscovite mica and the potassium feldspars are very closely related in chemical composition. The only difference is that there is a little water in the mica. There's another difference, and that was a structural difference. You've already seen how structural differences can be changed in solid rock or in the analogy of steel. So from the muscovite to the feldspar, we've had a structural change, and we've driven out some water, a very uh, usual or a very expectable, if you like, uh, process at considerable depth and pressure. And finally, in our series of six, a kind of gneiss that looks rather like granite. And we'll come back to the importance of having been able to produce something like granite in a moment. But what we've looked at so far are the characteristics that are visible in hand specimen, in the specimens that we have here in the, the studio. If we go to an outcrop, then we see another effect of heat and pressure on rocks. Very intricate folding. Not the kind of characteristic that we'd expect of a rock. It looks extremely plastic. Some of those folds are really acute, really intricate. The sort of thing that you would expect to be able to produce perhaps with plasticine, but not with rock. Rocks we think of as being very brittle, as being breakable with a, with a hammer. And that's, of course, the characteristic that they do have when we uh, hammer them at the, the Earth's surface. It's a question that we ought to ask ourselves. How is it that rocks are be able to behave in apparently such a contradictory fashion, to appear to have been plastic? This is a, um, a property that we can investigate further with another experiment. The rock is marble. And if we take a slab and place it in a hydraulic press and apply a stress to it, pressure from above, its behavior seems to confirm our suspicions of rocks as brittle substances. But if we take an, another slab, and this time insert a gauge, apply a stress again, the rock, in fact, bends, a pointer moving upward as the rock bends in the middle under the pressure. In fact, the rock is acting in an elastic fashion. It returns to its original shape when the stress is removed. This is not a behavior that perhaps you anticipated. But of course, the rock isn't very elastic. It can only stand very little pressure. But given a considerable amount of time, it may be that the rock can bend more than we think. This is silicon putty. And we can illustrate the importance of time in the behavior of rocks using this substance. When a stress is applied rapidly to the silicon putty, it shatters, just like rock shatters shatters into angular fragments. On the other hand, if the stress is applied slowly to the silicone putty, acting over a period of time instead of being instantaneous, the silicone putty behaves in a very different fashion. You might ask 